and welcome everybody here in Twitch chat and everybody on YouTube who's watching this video later on over there for our last installment of our Core Set 2020 Standard Set Review. We're here with the rest of the cards. We've gone through all five colors. We're going through multicolored artifact and lands, the things that we have left. So that's what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, if you missed any of the other colors, make sure you go back and watch those as well. Uh, the Hey, C. Freeman, thank you so much for that sub. I appreciate that. Um, we started with white, and so that color is where I really went through and uh, talked about how the grading scale works, uh, how we're grading all these cards for standard, giving them a letter grade A through F um, with kind of like the U.S. Uh, school grading system. So uh, not going to go through that again. But if you'd like, if you haven't checked that out, uh, you can also just look below, go to the, inf you know, go to the video description. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're here in Twitch chat, you can uh, do exclamation point grade uh, to, to find that where you can see all of the grades. Plus, you can see the grading scale that I have uh, written out there. Uh, one thing, Fs are for, are for rares and mythics that aren't going to see any or that shouldn't see any standard play kind of thing. And uh, for commons and uncommons that shouldn't see any standard play, but they weren't really designed to see standard play. They're designed for more for, you know, limited. I, I give those a limited review or a limited rating. So A through F and L are the ratings there. All right, without <clears throat> further ado, yep, all the other colors are up on, on YouTube right now, you know, but uh, now we're starting the multicolor. <laughs> without further ado, let's get started. All right, we got Corpse Knight, White Black, 2-2, two, two, Zombie Knight. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life. I like this card quite a bit. I think this is a really good uh, a really good role-playing card for Orzhov mid-range decks. It's very good in Knight Tribal. Like the, the, the creature types are very good, zombies and knights. Like it's good, uh, yeah, good creature types there. Um, yeah. Pairs well with Cruel Celebrant to do get even more pings, like start adding up all these opponents, lose a life kind of things, and, you know, like they add up a, a lot. I like Corpse Knight more than Cruel Celebrant. So I was kind of high on Cruel Celebrant last format, but, you know, we didn't, or when I did the last set review, but we didn't see it do a whole lot for us. But I like Corpse Knight a whole lot more for the main reason that it's a 2-2. What we find out with Cruel Celebrant is that being a 1-2 meant that it could never do anything in combat really and it didn't pressure the opponent and 1-2 is just is just kind of too weak but 2-2 two, two, you know once you start getting the 2 power in there that's a really big difference and, and a, an upgrade that people may not have really be focusing on too much but something that I think matters a whole lot for Corpse Knight's playability and then of course yeah we have like the Knight Tribal stuff with History of Benalia and everything um that's there but yeah making it yeah just making it a grizzly bear means that it actually gets to attack in and you know trade with you know other opponents creatures a whole lot more um so yeah i like corpse knight quite a bit uh, i think i think this is a pretty solid card um it would maybe be i guess a little bit better if it was like a vampire knight you know that that could maybe be uh helping it uh more there but let's see. So we have uh, for our grading scale here. Uh, is this going to be like a role player that sees play among multiple decks? Maybe, maybe not that high. So we're not really. I'm not really going with a B here. Probably more closer to a C. Powerful card. See some play in some fringe decks, kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'm thinking this is kind of more of a C. Yeah. I should have had something in here. Like the one thing I kind of regret from my my ratings I'm gonna have to do for next time is like a role player in fringe decks. I don't have like none of these descriptions were role players in fringe decks. I need to have something like that in there. Um, yeah, I kind of want to go C or C minus. I'm gonna go C minus with Corpse Knight maybe. Hmm. I think I want to go C minus. It is a it is a knight. But is there going to be like really a big black white? No, no we'll go see. All right, we'll go see. I'll, I'll pop it back up. Let's go see. 
Boom. <laughs> All right, Creeping Trail Blazer. You, you can see it right there. It's Blazing Trails. All right, so red, green, 2-2, two, two, elemental. Other elementals you control get plus 1, plus 0. Okay, that's a real thing. And pl pay 4 mana, Creeping Trailblazer gets plus 1, plus 1 until end of turn for each elemental you control. To be honest, I didn't know that this was... I hadn't seen this card before. I didn't really know this was a card whenever we were doing the, the red and green elementals. Uh, when I was doing my review with them. So maybe Red Green Elementals is going to be a fringe deck. So some of those cards I was giving like the limited rating to, maybe we should be giving them like D or D minus for just being like parts of a, a very, very fringe deck. Is this card that good? No. Is is like they're like, are we going to be building elemental decks and having them like tier one, tier two or anything like that? No. But... I guess they're I guess if we have this card, maybe maybe we can just you know, there'll be like fringe elemental decks, like which is basically like what like Merfolk and, and vampires and stuff like that were in like the current standard format kind of thing. Um so not yeah. So maybe we have something like that for some elementals, maybe. I'm not really expecting this to, to be a standard kind of card. I'm going to give this card, Creeping Trail Blazer, a D. Because there are some good elementals, but I don't think that... I don't think we really want... I don't think that, like, playing, like, these other... As I kind of talked about before, is that I don't think the best way to make the good elementals better is by playing cards like this. Like, playing, like, these commons and uncommons that are kind of meh kind of thing. Um... Yeah, so the good the good elementals don't really want to be in a tribal deck. Like you don't need you don't need a tribal elemental deck to make Nissa good. Nissa is just great. You know, the three mana Chandra, Chandra Fire Artisan, I believe, very good card. You don't need an elemental tribal synergy type thing for Chandra Fire Artisan. It's already a good card. Um, yeah, just wait till yeah if we have the tier one elemental deck and I'll just be eating my words here we'll see all right empyreon eagle uh one white uh yeah one white and blue for a two three flyer other creatures you control with flying get plus one plus one okay so we get our flying tribal card i think the the main reason why you'd want to play this card of course is safara i think safara is the main the main uh payoff for making your flying deck um but yeah, there could be a, a blue green, sorry, a blue white flyers deck. Uh, you can tell I've been talking for eight hours now <laughs> so far with the set review. Um, but yeah, there could be a, a blue white flyer deck with Safara and everything. It's kind of like a janky build around build around card, you know, make make your cool little janky deck here with a flyer deck. I don't know if that's I don't know if blue white's gonna be so necessary for the deck if you're just gonna to want to be mono white, if you're gonna want blue or not. I don't know. Maybe. So yeah. Imperion Eagle. Cool. We'll give it a D. Yeah, get your two two healers hawk on. Get your three four to meek. Yeah, we'll give it a D. Yeah. Our guys burn. Alright, we got Iron Root. Warlord, one green and a white for an X5. The power is equal to the number of creatures you control, and you can pay five mana to make a one-one white soldier creature token. Five is a lot of toughness. Uh, this, you know, it's okay. Like this is okay against aggro. Like five's a lot of toughness for three mana. I think that's the best part of the card. You know, one five, a two five kind of thing against like you know as a a cyborg card against aggro. Is that one of the best 75 cards you can play? Probably not. Um, probably not, though. But definitely awesome and limited. Amazing and limited with, like, that, yeah, like, the making creature tokens and stuff. But, yeah, it is expensive. We've we've talked a whole lot about how 1-1s one are just not valuable. And 5 mana for a 1-1, one one, really not valuable. Um... Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go with the L for the limited rating here for the the. 
Iron Root Warlord. All right, Kalia, Kalia, Kalia. Let's go, Kalia. Kalia, Zenith Seeker. Red, white, black. Three, three, Flying Vigilance. All right, three mana, three, three, Flying Vigilance. We're talking. That's a good, good rate, good stats. It's Mardu colors. Mardu colors are cool. Let's see what we got here. Whenever Kalia, Zenith Seeker enters the battlefield, look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal, reveal an angel, a demon, and or a dragon from among them and put them into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. That and, and uh, part of that is clutch. So you can get multiple cards. You can get an angel and a demon, you know, and a dragon. So, you know, yeah. So you, we're putting this in a deck with like a bunch of cool, like this seems like a card, like a cool mythic to put in a deck with a bunch of other cool mythics. Is it turning into like a tier one deck? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem like, like how much interaction do you really want to be playing in a Kalia deck? Cause you're going to want a lot of like all those things. So you can get some other hits and everything. <laughs> Pick a tribe search.com. Um, yeah, definitely a good commander card. Absolutely. This is definitely a good commander card. Um, yes. Five cult, yes, it can get Niv Mizzet reborn. Niv Mizzet reborn is a dragon avatar, so yes, this does get the five color Niv Mizzet. Um, but a cool little card. Like even if this is just like, even if you're just playing this in like Mardu Angels, which you know Mardu Angels is certainly a deck that I've played a whole lot. This is a three mana three three plus draw card kind of thing. Like you know, look at six cards, put put a. Lyra or Seraph for the Scales or Resplendent Angel or anything like that into your hand. Um, there are some pretty good demon cards in this set. Also, and you know, we, we have some good demon cards in Standard, most notably like Doom Whisperer. Also, um, you know, there's there's definitely good dragon cards. Also, for the most part, it's like always drawing five drops. It's the kind of thing, the kind of the problem is like the angels, the demons, the dragons, they're all like five mana cards. You know, for the obviously for the most, you know, not every single one, but you know, you're kind of looking at like, all right, let's what what five drop can I find to put in my my hand? And and the thing about five drops is while they're very good, you can't really have a deck filled with five drops, kind of thing. Um. Oh, I think Doom Whisper is a demon. I thought so. I thought so. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a horror. Maybe it's both. Maybe it's a demon horror. So what are we doing with Kalia? We're probably... it's. This is probably kind of a... Is this a, a powerful card for a fringe deck? Or is it... Yeah, I guess it's probably closer to that than a janky build-around card. Hmm... Maybe it's kind of janky build around card. Maybe kind of between those two. So that's a C and a D. So kind of, uh, kind of right between those two. It's a it's a legend. Let's go C minus. Yeah, there, there's other yeah. There's of course four mana cards that are good to grab. Yeah, Seraph of the Scales. Um, there's the new three mana demon from this set um and everything there yeah she yeah she's okay cool card definitely a card that i i probably like more than like how good it is kind of thing okay i wish i wish that kalia herself was like an angel demon dragon instead of a human cleric that would be awesome if Kalia was a, an angel demon dragon and could just kind of fit in like like with Lyra Dawnbringer pumping Kalia and all that kind of stuff. All right, we have Keth we have Kethis, the hidden hand, white, black, green, legendary spells you cast cost one less to cast. Yes, please, give me that. 
I'm a big fan of that. And then exile two legendary cards from your graveyard, and then until end of turn, each legendary card in your graveyard gains, you may play this card from your graveyard. This is a pretty sweet looking card here. A three mana, three, four, good body against aggro and everything. Um, yeah, Abzan Legends. Oh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to be putting together an Abzan Legends deck here with Kethis, for sure. Um, make our Kamal's Jordic Vow cost one less. Uh, yeah, make, you know, so many, you know, Planeswalkers and creatures that you can be saying there and make them cost one less. Pretty cool little Elf Advisor here. Um, yep, yeah, Brontodon sized. Not bad, not bad. Usually, like... Like look at this look at this elf advisor. Does this elf advisor look like a 3-4? Like a 3-4 is big. You know, like bigger than all these things. I don't know. 3-4s are big. Like it's just a little elf advisor. Shouldn't it just be like a 1-1 one -one or something? Um But yeah, so Kethis is is definitely yeah, definitely build around for sure. Um I think powerful card for a fringe deck. I think that's like that's just kind of the definition here that we have for Kefis, which is perfect. So I think this is just a perfect uh, C here. You know, build around. You know, make a, a fringe deck. I don't. I don't think that there's going to be like that. This is going to see play in like a tier one, tier two kind of deck kind of thing. Um, the pen is mightier than the crown. That's good. Good flavor text. Yeah, and you, yeah, you do have to get get rid of two legendary cards just to cast any other thing. The main thing is that the legendary spells cost one less. That's the main thing there. Uh, Kai car, key car. Are we keying cars? That's rude. You don't want to key a car. Um. Maybe Kaikar. Kaikar. Wind's Fury. One blue, red, green. So one plus Jeskai for a 3-3 three, three flyer. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying, and you may also sacrifice a spirit to add a red mana. All right, so we have Murmuring Mystic in standard right now. That costs four mana, is a 1-5, and whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you make a 1-1. One, one. This is... You know, same kind of thing, except for you have to jump through more hoops by playing Jeskai Collar instead of just blue. And you get a 3-3 flyer instead of a 1-1 one, one on the ground. That's not a very big up. Like, I don't, like a 3-3 three, three flyer is, is almost always better than a 1-5. Not all the time. But, you know, in general, a 3-3 three, three flyer is going to be better than a 1-5. But you do have to have... It has a lot harder mana cost than Murmuring Mystic with one blue, red, green, or sorry, one blue, red, white. So you got a harder mana cost there. So since since you got that harder mana cost, we also have that other ability, sacrifice a spirit, add a red to your mana pool. Um, that, yep, that's ability is the shining star. So you definitely need to build around this card and definitely need to play, you know, you wanna play a lot of spells and you really want to be able to do something a lot with red you know, do something with a lot of red mana um so i'm not really seeing this in like a jeskai feather deck i don't think well maybe actually yeah i could see this in a jeskai feather deck yeah i could all your spells make one ones and stuff um but yeah maybe like a jeskai phoenix seems to work pretty well with uh the red finale is something that that uh kind of comes to mind right away um, it is it is a little lackluster to make red. Red is yeah. You definitely would rather make blue than red. Um, so I don't I don't know exactly what we're gonna do with this card. I don't know exactly what we're gonna do with this card. Um, yeah, if you if you do sack three spirits and play a red finale for one then you get your three spirits back. So yeah, you can, you know, basically make it free kind of thing. Yep, can make a whole lot of tokens with Sahili into Kaikar here. It's this is definitely not a bad card. I feel like like 
I'm going to give this like a lower grade because it's kind of similar to Murmuring Mystic. But this is the kind of card that could end up being in a tier one deck or tier two deck or like, you know, a, a very popular deck that that's like doing well in tournaments and stuff like that. This card can. These cards aren't going to. I can tell you that. The ceiling on this card's a lot higher than the ceiling on these other cards for standard. So where I, I realistically think it ends up is probably like uh, a C, a powerful card in a fringe deck. Maybe maybe a little more, maybe just a C plus. But there's there's a lot of potential here with Kaikar Winds Fury with the ability to get to gain more mana um that's something that uh that's always like where cards in standard that are a lot more powerful in practice than what they looked like that's that's like something that's like a main reason why is is the whole um mana uh i don't know not engine but um that uh i don't know that anchor of magic that that we have the mana system of you know playing one land a turn something that like can get you a whole lot more mana whenever uh, on a turn that you're not really supposed to have that much mana uh those are the kind of things that um can really go crazy there's there are like how many of how many like one single red uh, cyclers are there yeah you can you can sacrifice afterlife spirit also yeah you can you can you can sacrifice any spirits so yeah um yeah so that's where some degenerate stuff happens are there just so there's just there's the eight so you can play four so there's two of them you, you can play four and four i know there's like crash through there's like one you know like the cost of red and cycles there's like warlord's fury are those the only two um I think I think those like if there's other ones like if you can like oh Ryle so yeah Ryle would be one so there's three um yeah deals one damage Ryle deals one damage to our creature you control that creature deal gains trample draw a card mm. we can't Ryle too much but um. So yeah, all of those are like basically zero mana cyclers with Kaikar. So you know, like how much do you want zero mana cyclers? Like, it's not bad, not bad. All right, so we're going with C plus here for Kaikar, but it has it has some good potential. Um, I don't know exactly how or where, but like this is the kind of card that could break out. All right, so those are the only three: Ryle, Crash Through, and Warlord's Fury. All right, Lightning, Stormkin, Blue, and a Red, 2-2, Flying Haste. Cool little card. Uh, def definitely just a limited card, but not, not a bad one. Uh, does Blue Red Wizards, I guess, could play this, I suppose, if Blue Red Wizards wants this creature. I mean, it's it's not it's not too bad. Like, it's, it's strong enough to be in a Blue Red Wizard deck if there's enough other things for the Wizard deck to help out with it. Um, but yeah, it looks like a great card for limited. Yeah, snap, snap limited pick. Yep. I'll go with the L, but again, like this could be, it could be a card in a wizard's deck. Moldervine Reclamation. Three black, green enchantment. Whenever a creature you control dies, gain a life, draw a card. Can we put this Moldervine Reclamation in our Kaikar Winds Fury deck? So we cast a non-creature spell, we, we get a, a spirit, then we sack the spirit to add a mana, and then we gain a life and draw a card. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, but the Moldervine Reclamation... Yeah, probably not going to be for standard, but I don't know. It's a it's a powerful enchantment. Creature you control dies, gain a life, draw a card. Powerful enchantment, but five mana cards in standard are really, really good. I'm going to go with an, an L for a limited rating here for the Moldervine Reclamation, but... 
I don't know. Cool card. We'll kind of keep that one in mind. Ogre Siegebreaker. Two black red, four three. And you can pay two black red to destroy target creature that was dealt damage this turn. A good limited card. I think about these multicolor cards are going to be good limited cards. Not so much for standard there. Omnith Locus of the Royal. One and then Teamer Color. <clears throat> Green, blue, red. For a 3-3, when Omnith Locus of the Royal enters the battlefield, it deals damage to any target equal to the number of elementals you control. Hmm. I keep on saying that, like, elementals aren't going to be a deck, and now they just keep on giving you more cards that you're like, oh, okay, well, maybe elementals can be a deck. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a 1-1 counter on target elemental you control, and if you control eight or more lands, draw a card. Okay, read the next card also before. All right, next card, one green and a blue, one one for Risen Reef. Whenever Risen Reef or another elemental enters the battlefield under your control, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield tapped. If you don't put the card onto the battlefield, put it into your hand. That card's good. There's a three mana Coiling Oracle in this? In this? In this set that turns all your other elementals into coiling oracles? You don't even have to reveal the card though too. Don't you like reveal the card with coiling oracle? So yeah, there's a three mana tribal coiling oracle. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, Looks like maybe we have to start making this Teamer Elementals kind of a thing. Mana's tough. We're playing Teamer and everything. It's not... It's not like a... a it's still, even with everything that we've seen so far... <laughs> it's not... Uh, yeah, 1-1s one are weak, and this, this deck does make a lot of 1-1s, one but... It's not like a tier one or tier two deck. Like, I don't think this is going to, like, I don't think this is like when Ravnica Allegiance made Gates a deck. I don't think that, like, this will be as big as, like, what Gates was, for example. But honestly, maybe, maybe after rotation, because, like, all these elemental cards we're talking about, you know, Nyssa and then all these cards, they're not really rotating out. Yeah, Living Twister. Hmm. Yeah, three mana Chandra is very good. All right, so how am I grading these now? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm already kind of eating my words here. Um, so maybe, all right, so powerful card for a fringe deck is a C. So Omnith and Risen Reef both seem like a pow like powerful cards for a fringe deck. If there's going to be a fringe elemental deck, these are both good cards for it. So I guess we're we're going with a couple Cs. Is Omnith really better than Risen Reef? Is Risen Reef a C minus? Risen Reef is really strong. That that effect is really strong whenever you're able to like pump out little tiny elementals with like Chandra. This is a really good card. And then yeah, Omnith may be worse than Risen Reef, honestly, yeah. Yeah, I had not seen this Risen Reef card. I had seen Omnith before, but I had not seen this Risen Reef card. Huh. Okay, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with C for Risen Reef. I'm gonna give give them just both C's across the board. I'm gonna give them both C's. So we're gonna do good cards for a very fringe deck. But I guess you know y'all have talked me into elementals being a fringe deck now. 
I wasn't convinced of that before. I think I think so yeah, you said Rhythm's a four of, Omnit's like a one of. I think I think this is more than a one of. I think you'd play two or three of these. The the deals damage to any target is pretty nice. You know, think about like Chupacabra, like ETB kill something. This could be like you know, Flame Tongue Kavu, I guess, is like kind of the more thing. But yeah, you know, ETB deals some damage to something, but any target means it it goes upstairs, uh, which is real, you know, ETB deal like four damage upstairs if you have four elementals kind of thing. Like that's that's pretty nice, honestly. And yeah, it goes to walkers and, and everything. So yeah, I think this would be like a two or a three of and like a four of. Just like, you know, gotta make sure like the mana works, you know, probably playing like Paradise Druids and things like that. Sean, like new Chandra is red red also, so like the red red is is tough if you're trying to play Teamer. Like trying to play Risen Reef at green blue and then Chandra at red red. That's tough. Yeah, any target text is very, very valuable for sure. Neoform elementals. Ooh. Yeah, this thing's an elemental. Maybe we're going five color. It's probably four. Probably don't have white elementals. So four color Neoform elementals. All right, Sky Knight Vanguard. Red, white, one, two, flying. Whenever it attacks, you make a one, one. Red haste. No. I mean, it is just a two mana one, two, but one, twos are not very valuable, as we've talked about. This could this could see a little bit of play in Boro stuff, I suppose. If you attack, you make a one, one. That's also attacking. So it's basically a, a two three split between two bodies, and then yeah, maybe. Y'all think it, is this? So basically, is this D minus or is this L? Is this just limited only, or will this see just a tiny bit of standard play, and be a D minus? That's what that's where I'm kind of debating between with these two or with this. No, let's go L. We have Swift Blade Vindicator. That's awesome. That doesn't see any play. Yeah, it's like an L+. Plus. <laughs> All right, Tomb Bound Lich. One blue, black, one three. Like, Boros cards, like, this also just kind of gets down because it's a Boros card. Like, the Boros cards aren't that great. <laughs> All right, Tomb Bound Lich, uh, one, and then <clears throat> one a blue and a black for one three with Death Touch and Life Link, and whenever it enters the battlefield, or it, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you get to draw a card, then discard a card. This card's not bad. You know, like, three mana, one three, ETB, draw a card, discard a card. So, you know, you get to loot. And then you also have a Death Toucher that, like, trades with other things, and it also can gain a little bit of life with the Life Link. It's not a bad card. It's really not. Like, this could be a decent sideboard card uh, for your blue-black decks against aggro that, you know, it blocks whatever like green creature is like scary and also you know loots and has lifelink and stuff i think this is a probably like a d here yeah it's no thief it, this is yeah it's not it's not nearly as good at thief of sanity as attacking this is more of like a defensive card um against aggro decks for your like blue black control deck kind of thing i'll give it a d It's it's not really the card that you want to bring in against other control decks as a threat. That's that's not really what this card's for. It's like your aggro decks take out their removal and then you bring in your tomb bound lich. All right, Yarok. 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 Hey. Yeah. Yarok. Y'all want to rock? Y'all rock. I don't know. All right, Yarok the desecrated two and then soul tie so two black green blue for a three five another death touch life linker um if a permanent enters the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger that ability triggers an additional time this card is sweet do you smell what your rock is cooking <laughs> oh that's pretty good yeah so this is a really cool yeah so this is panharmonicon right and um yeah, this triggers any permanent. Uh, you don't want to play this with negative thing like the 
the uh, Lotus Field. I don't think you really want to play this with Lotus Field because then you have to sacrifice four lands. Ugh. Don't want to do that. Um, but this is a pretty cool card. So is this going to see a whole lot of play? No. I mean, it. it's really, dis you know, you can only play it in like one kind of deck, you know, like your Soul Tie deck kind of thing. But there's a lot of good ETB effects in Soul Tie. Um, you can maybe pair this with like Moldratha kind of thing. You know, get like your Ravenous Chupacabras and all that kind of stuff. Um, the Green Cavalier would work well with this for sure. Or just, you know, like your Elvish Rejuvenators and that kind of stuff. Yeah, Elvish Rejuvenator works really well with this card. Uh, get this in a, a Neoform deck or a Vanifar deck. Uh, yeah, Play Crafter is pretty awesome with this. I suppose, unless you have don't have any other creatures, then you have to sacrifice your your rock. Um, yeah, pretty cool card. Definitely powerful. All right, so a B would be a defining card in a singular, highly played deck, or a power. A C is a powerful card in a fringe deck. I think we're kind of between those two. Here, I want to give it better than a C. Um, I gave the the. Kaikar was a C plus. I think it's kind of similar to Kaikar. Maybe a little better. It's it's a lot easier to build around this thing. It's like this is a better like day one build around this. This is a can you figure out how this card's kind of broken kind of card. So this this has a, a lot lower floor than that one, but it, it or sorry, this has a higher floor, a much higher floor, but a lower ceiling than Kaikar. Oh yeah, this with Command the Dread Horde, and then you get all your millions of explore cre explore triggers and everything. Does this just go as like a one of in, in like the explore deck with Command the Dread Horde? Like maybe. Honestly, maybe. That probably bumps it up if it's in there. Let's go with the B I could see that, honestly. Yeah. I I could see that. Let's go with the B minus for that card. Pretty good card. You can find some room for it. And then we have Rien, Angel of Rebirth. This is the buy a box promo. Two, and then Naya, two red, green, white for a legendary creature angel. So we got a five mana, five, four, flying angel. Yeah. Want a pencil? Um, whenever another multicolor creature you control dies. Oh, your other multicolor creatures get plus one, plus zero. And then whenever a multicolor creature you control dies, return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. It's a cool little card. Yeah, this is like maybe like a, a one of in a multicolor deck, you know, in a Naya deck, uh, a Naya angel deck, or just, you know, a Naya multicolor deck. This is like a maybe one of. That's kind of about it. Um, I don't really see it being any, any uh, more than that kind of thing um yeah if you could play it in aristocrats it would definitely be a lot better for you but you're not really playing sacrifice stuff in naya colors and you'd have to, it's only when multicolor creatures dies then you put them back in your hand and of course you put them back in your hand at end step kind of like feather um i kind of think this is more of like a d honestly I think that's where I'm at with Rien here, D. All right, let's go to the, let's head on over to the artifacts. Anvil Rot Raptor, four mana, two one, flying first strike. That's a cool bird to put in the limited rating. Up next, we have Bag of Holding, a one mana artifact. Whenever you discard a card, exile that card from your graveyard. And then you can pay two mana, tap it, draw a card, then discard a card. So you can pay two mana to loot anytime you want. And then you can pay four mana, sacrifice the Bag of Holding, and return all the cards that you've exiled with Bag of Holding to their owner's hands. Hmm. Hmm. I'm not, I'm not so sure about this card. So it's it's a one mana artifact. Like you really need to build around your discard theme, of course. 
But yeah, like when you have stuff like Vivian's arc bow, it could be kind of cool. And everything. There's like there's like some fringe applications for this card. But the thing is, is like, are you actually putting this card in your deck? So it's, it's a little one mana artifact. Like Imagine drawing this card like kinda ever. You'd have to like pay three mana just to loot. Like imagine being behind and drawing this card. You just you just lose on the spot. It's like, are we really putting a card in our deck that if you draw it when you're behind, you just die? Like, I just, I don't, I don't know. Is this, is this really that power, you know, powerful enough? Can you build around it enough with the discard stuff? I kind of feel like you, like either, either you want to play with like Vivian's Arcbow, or you'd probably want to play in a red deck. There's a lot of cards in red decks that are like discard and then draw some, you know, like Remati Reveler and your Tormenting Voices and your uh, your Red Cavalier and like that kind of stuff. Um, so maybe you can play it in, in that kind of deck. But then is it, you know, you're jumping through a lot of hoops here. Are you really getting that good of a payoff for then like later on in the game? You, you four mana, you sacrifice it to return some cards back to your hand if we think about like divination is you know like three mana draw two like this back of holding you're going to definitely want to get more than two cards from it so you're going to have to have like this in play on like turn one or like early and then you're going to need to play like three plus cards because i think if you're just getting two cards back it's really not that good you're going to play like you're going to discard like three plus cards after playing bag of holding and then after that then then you're going to need another turn where you can just spend four mana and get rid of your bag of holding to, to redraw those three plus cards, which you didn't want earlier in the game. And you need your opponent not to just, you know, get rid of your bag of holding it at all with like a t Teferi minus or, you know, anything else kind of thing. It just seems like it's kind of pie in the sky to get this card to actually work and be like where you're like... Wow, that was that was a really good card for us, kind of thing. Um, so that's 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 my kind of take on bag of holding. I know that's it's a card that a lot yeah a lot of y'all are excited about. Um, I I'm gonna go with the D here for bag of holding. It's it's not an F. It's not a never play it whatsoever. Probably. You really got it's a janky build around card. You really got to build around this thing, but I'm not seeing it being too successful. We'll, we'll go with the D here. All right, we got the Colossus Hammer, colorless, uh, one colorless for an artifact equipment. <clears throat> equipped creature gets plus 10, plus 10, loses flying, and has equipped cost of eight. Are there cards in standard that just auto equip stuff? Like there, there could be from like the previous sets. I'm not sure if there's any in standard though. Yeah, you definitely want to put the Colossus Hammer on the Ferocious Pup. Absolutely, the pup deserves a hammer. Yeah, so this is a card to keep in mind. Um, yeah, Nahiri is the only thing that it helps with equip costs. Okay, a card to keep in mind for fall sets and everything. Sahili making it a blade cheat equipping with it for one. So you could have, you have like another equipment in play that only costs like one to equip and you have this and you have Sahili and you have Sahili copy the hammer and turn it into something else. And then you equip it and then, and then the next turn, then it turns back into the Colossus hammer and now your creature, the following turn, has plus 10, plus 10. That's cool. That's a neat party trick to pull off. You can do that at, at FNM or something. All right, so yeah, going to give this the L for the limited rating, but yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's busted. I'm going to do it. Um, I don't know exactly what Nahiri says. I don't know how much Nahiri actually reduces that cost, honestly. Um, what, Nahiri the lith? No. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember that. Do we have a that's a neat party trick grade? I don't think so. <laughs> she reduces them by one. Oh man, that's that's not gonna do it. She need reduces needs to reduce them by like one hundred. Yeah, as long as your turn creatures you control at first strike and equip abilities you activate costs one less to activate. Yeah, that's not worth it. All right, Diamond Knight. Oh, it's getting late. Uh, this card is Diamond Might. All right, Diamond Knight. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we have a knight. All right, yeah, good, good night. All right, I'm done. <laughs> Diamond Knight. Uh, three mana, one, one Vigilant. As Diamond Knight enters the battlefield, choose a color whenever... Uh, you cast a spell of the chosen color, put a 1-1 counter on it, Diamond Knight. Yeah, we're not playing this thing. Where's the L? Getting an L for just that, that pun. <laughs> All right, Diviner's a lock. <laughs> if you have Nahiri and four spark doubles... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if we play Nahiri and then Spark Double Nahiri, Spark Double Nahiri, Spark Double Nahiri, Spark Double Nahiri. So you can have five Nahiris in play. Then this cost only cost three to equip. <laughs> oh man. Okay. All right, Diviner's Lockbox, uh, four mana artifact. You pay one, you tap it, you choose a card name, then reveal the top card of your library. If that card has the chosen name, you sacrifice Diviner's Lockbox and you draw three cards and you can activate this ability only anytime you could cast a sorcery. Uh, I guess, so a couple of things you have, we have Surveil, we have Explore. There are a lot of good Surveil and Explore cards that you can leave a card on top. We have... Uh, the the card that of course comes to mind immediately is this thing that I don't remember the name of it. Scheming Symmetry. You go search your library for a card, put it on top for one mana, and then spend your other mana to activate this thing and draw three cards. Now is it worth playing Scheming Symmetry and then spending five mana for this Diviner's Lock Box? just to draw three cards? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. All right. So we'll we'll go L for limited. You can you can just play some other card that's a 5 mana draw 3 probably or something similar. Um you know, if you're playing black, black has there's uh Liliana's contract is 5 mana draw 4 lose 4 life. If you want, you can just play that. You can just draw four cards and lose four life instead. <laughs> Thanks, Rex. Well, Lockbox, it's getting... Well, I know it's not good enough for limited, but uh, it's you know not for standard, so it's a common or uncommon, so it gets an L for a limited card. This card could be... Honestly, this could be good enough for limited. Like, especially if you're playing, like, a single-color deck. I mean, you just get to choose a card name. Like, you just say planes. You know, you're playing, like, a mono-white deck or whatever. Or maybe you're playing, like, a white-black deck, but you have a lot of planes. You know, you just tab it, planes. Like, this could be good enough for limited. You gain three... You get to draw three cards if it's a planes. Yeah, big maybe. All right, Golos... Tireless Pilgrim, 5 mana, 3, 5, Legendary Artifact Creature Scout. 
When Golas Tileus Pilgrim enters the battlefield, search your library for any land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. I am in. Five mana, three five creature, go rampant growth for any land at all and put it onto the battlefield. That is awesome. I'm in there. Cool card. Good card. I think that's yeah. Good card here. Um a lot of cool things you can do with this. You know, we you know, obviously there's Neoform, there's Vanifar, uh, but you know, we're if we're you know putting together our, our Yurok, your rock deck, our your rock deck, we want to go low, so we want to go get multiple lands, put them into play. Absolutely. Let me do that for sure. Uh, and this can just kind of fit anywhere. It's colorless. Any deck that wants to ramp at all. Um, this is a you know, it's an artifact you can go grab with Karn. You know, like your four mana Karn, you minus go grab, you know, from your from your uh, sideboard, go grab your Golos. Uh, next turn, you you play your Golos, um, and you know, go search for you know, like your Field of Ruin because you're like going Crucible stuff with your Mono Green Tron deck. You got your Ugin that co makes your Golos cost, you know, two less mana, which is cool. Um, a lot of cool little things you can do with this card. Uh, and then there's also another ability, I suppose, I should probably read. So this other ability, which it looks kind of crazy, two and then one of every color of mana. So we're probably not doing this other ability, but we'll check it out. So two and one of every other color of mana. Exile the top three cards of your library. You may play them this turn without paying their mana costs. That's awesome. So you don't have to sacrifice your Golos. You can do that like kind of every single turn. If you have seven mana with like every single color, you can kind of just do that each turn. Yeah, whenever you untap your lands, you got seven mana, do it again. Three cards. You can play them. Yeah, that this looks pretty sweet with the Niv Mizzet Reborn. Uh, you don't get to grab Golos off of Niv Mizzet Reborn, of course, but you know, you have your draw steps and everything. You can just draw a Golos. Golos is kind of just better than Chromatic Lantern. I feel like for that deck, like where you it still kind of access chromatic lantern, where you just go find whatever whatever land you're missing, um, and then you know you get to like start casting your misery born or activating your golos if it stays alive. Definitely cool. Can we make so? Can we have our your rock deck just be five color also? Can this be in our five color elementals deck? Five color elemental with this scout here. It's a cool card. Why would three mana Teferi make you frown with this card? Oh, it no, because you can play them this turn. So you can play that. You don't have to play it. Like it's not. It's not like you play them instant speed. You play them. You can play your card sorcery speed. And like Teferi bouncing your Golos, you just play it again and go rampant growth again, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, it's good in a legendary deck. Absolutely. Yeah, get it up here in a legendary deck. Yeah, this is a yeah. If you have a bunch of Paradise Druids, yeah, you can just kind of play this, pay these extra things with Paradise Druids. Definitely, definitely. You know, you just you just can be playing like your Soul Tide deck and just have like you know a black white land or like a blue white land and a black red land, for example, and and you know your your Golos goes and finds one of them, you know, kind of thing. Or maybe you just have like a maybe you just randomly have a. I guess you wouldn't want the, the two on the same thing, but um, yeah, I don't know. I like this card. I'm I'm a fan of Golos. I'm a fan. I'm going with a C. Yeah, I'm going with a C with the Golos. I think you can kind of put this in a lot of different places. It's going to be like a role player in a lot of different fringe decks kind of thing that it can be. I don't know. I like the card. I'm going C. Graph Digger's Cage. One colorless artifact, creature cards in graveyards and libraries can't enter the battlefield, and players can't cast spells from graveyards or libraries. This is a really, really nice cyborg card. Uh, especially, I was talking about it on stream yesterday for Grixis Control as a way to stop Experimental Frenzy, keep them from casting the, the cards in the library. It's just a great, great card against Experimental Frenzy, which is a really popular card of course 
Um, it does shut down like Arcbow and uh, Bullis Citadel. Some cards that I'm I'm a little less happy that it shuts down. You know, stops rekindling Phoenix from coming back. Stops command kind of stops command the Dread Horde. It, it stops half of command the Dread Horde. Stops the creature half. Doesn't stop the Planeswalker half. So you've got to pair it with like the Immortal Sun. Good sideboard card to have in like your Karn deck. You know, if we're playing a Karn deck, we get like this is a really nice artifact sideboard card. This definitely makes Karn a lot better because. The more good artifacts to have in your, in your sideboard that you want in your sideboard, the better Karn is. Um, but yeah, this is going to be a very common sideboard card, which is a B, but I think even better than that. So yeah, I think this is B+. I, I, like, I like B+, for this. I think this is like the like a really, really good sideboard card that like a lot of people can play. Because it's colorless. You can go in, in basically any deck. They can just be like, ah, I'm, I, my deck's bad against Frenzy. Craft Digger's Cage. Sweet. Kind of thing. Um, oh man, yeah, Pithing Needle would be nice too. Uh, so the reason why this doesn't, yeah, no, this 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 ignores the timing restrictions because it says you may play them this turn, right? Without paying their mana cost, it doesn't say like right now, right? I don't know. I guess somebody would somebody like a judge, somebody who's a judge would have to let me know if. If Little Teferi stops this or not, I don't know if it does. Because the fact that it says this turn makes me feel like you can kind of wait and, and do them whenever you want, like during throughout the entire turn. Um, so you can do stuff sorcery speed, so you don't have to. So I don't think Teferi shuts this down. All right, definitely fine. Okay, cool. All right, Craft Air's Cage B+. Plus. Heart Piercer Bow, two mana artifact equipment. Whenever equipped creature attacks, it deals one damage to target creature. Defending player controls, and it has equip one. This is just a limited card. The, there is like the the card um, that we talked about that was that was kind of decent back in white at the very beginning. Talked about forever ago. Uh, nope, it's not that one. There's there's some card. They can go find that card. I don't remember what it was. But it seems like it was forever ago. Hmm. Maybe I'm just imagining things. Wasn't there a card that says it goes and gets that? Oh, it's blue? Oh, yeah, it's blue. It's some mana creature in blue. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Where's the mana creature? There we go. Renowned Weaponsmith. We found it. I like this card. I talked about how I like this card that can cast artifact spells. I like this, you know, go, you know, I like this card, like to ramp into Golas. Like you play this for Renowned Weaponsmith on turn two, turn three, you play your land. You have your three mana tap, add two for Golas that goes and ramps you. It's a good card. However, this second ability here, this basically just doesn't need to exist. Don't put Heart Piercer Bow or Vial of Dragon Fire in your deck. But I think like the first part, it could actually, like this can actually be like a decent card. Um, for the for the first part, go make these artifacts cost two less. You know, go go get you some more mana for your meteor golems and your goalless tireless pilgrims and stuff. Want to play like a, a blue artifact Karn deck with that renowned weaponsmith? Do it. All right, Icon of Ancestry is a three mana artifact. As Icon of Ancestry enters the battlefield, you choose any creature type, and then creatures you control of the chosen type get plus one, plus one. And you may also do pay three and tap it and look at the top three cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card of the chosen type from among them and put it into your hand and then put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. I've seen some people really, really high on this card. And... I th I think they're overrating the card. Like from I've seen some overrating in for this card. I I don't think it's it's too strong to be honest. So yeah, we get Radiant Destiny for any for any tribe, right? Like you you know it's it's colorless. It goes in any tribe. I think the the most common tribe that we're kind of looking at here probably is vampires. How vampire got a, a lot of stuff, especially the Soren in this set. That's, that's kind of like where we're looking at. But yeah, maybe if we're playing knights or, or anything like this. 
Um, and yeah, like, yeah, the white enchantment in Ixalan that was, was this was, was definitely bad. You know, like the radiant destiny, not, not very good, but I think that's the name of the card, right? Radiant destiny. My, hopefully I have the, the right name there. So the reason why people like this is this ability here, this, this three mana tap ability. Um, so this is, look at the top three cards of your library, reveal a creature card from the chosen type among them and put it into your hand. So I think people are like expecting like a deck like Vampires or something like that to be able to have an Anthem that helps, helps them get a lot of card advantage to grind other people out. But I'm not sure if it's really that, if it's going to be that way. One, artifacts are, you know, fairly, fairly vulnerable these days. You know, there's a good amount of things that, that get rid of artifacts. Two, you're only looking at three cards in, you know, your top three cards. You're going to be missing a decent amount of time. Like, only three cards is not very much, especially, like, after sideboard sideboarding, if you start having some more spells in your in your deck that's not just, like, the, the creatures of the chosen type. You know, you may not whiff, like, half the time, but it's not going to be... It's like probably more than like a fourth of the time or maybe like around a third of the time or something like that. I don't know like the exact math. This is just kind of like ballparking it off the top of my head. Three cards is not very many. Um, if you kind of think of like Vivian's tick up or tick down, like when you look at like that's looking at four cards and, you know, you miss a creature sometimes and that's any creature. Like so like if every single creature in your deck is a part of this whatever this creature this tribe is but like is your deck going to be that good if like like so much basically all of your deck are just creatures of that tribe are you really making like that good of a deck compared to like how like decks are these days i don't think you are like there's a like if you think about like how good like your esper decks are and your soul tie decks and stuff like that I don't think your icon of ancestry looking at three cards and then you know you know sometimes you know, maybe like more than half the time, you know, like 60, 70% of the time, you know, maybe 70% of the time or whatever like that, you're drawing a card. But then, you know, you don't get to put it into play, you know, it's just like drawing the card. So then it's not like a Vivian activation that doesn't cost any mana. That costs three of your mana. So then you also have to like spend other mana to try to try to play your thing. Um, yeah, so... I guess elves. Okay, I kind of like this with elves. All right. See, so yeah, I was definitely thinking about more with vampires. With elves, you have extra mana. That's why I like it because you do get extra mana with elves. With all the elves being mana creatures. Um. One thing this does, like with Soren, you know, Soren does have that ability, like the minus. I think minus three for Soren, but it has a minus ability to put a creature from your hand onto play. So if you like, you spend your mana on this, you find something, you can minus your Soren, put it into play. That's something that can happen. But I think overall, I think a lot of people are overrating this card. I've seen like I've seen multiple people think this is like one of like like the very best cards in the set, like have it as like their best card in the set, or like other people think it's really that good. And and I'm not I'm not there. I'm really not. No, this isn't like an F. I don't think it's like unplayable. Um I, th I think it's a card people will put in some free... I do think it's better than, like, Radiant Destiny. And the fact that it's an artifact and can kind of go anywhere, you can, you know, you can put this in, like, an elemental deck or, you know, other things like that. Um, so I think I would go with... Uh, I don't know. We're going with, like, a D or a C. Here. What's what's wrong with the stream? I guess the stream went away for a little bit. That's weird. For a couple of seconds. Huh. Just got bounced for a second. Sorry about that. So basically what I was saying is I think that we're in like a, a D to a C range here with this card. Um, I'm not sure exactly where I want to go between that, between like the C to D. Uh I kind of like, I kind of like D plus, and I kind of like C minus. I, you know, it's basically the same thing. 
we'll go D plus. I think people are overrating this card. I could go C minus to try to make to try to uh, hinge a little different to see if if other people are really liking it. Where this card could be good, where I could be underrating it, to be honest, is if you're playing that kind of, you know, if you have a good amount of mana in those kind of decks, if you actually have an extra three mana to spend every turn, like if you're playing elves and you have an extra three mana to spend every turn, where like the activation is basically free because you're, you're not going to use the extra mana. So like if you're in like the late, late game with like your vampire decks or, you know, whatever, like when, when like that three doesn't, isn't really taking up very much of your turn, then this is a whole lot better. Um, I'll go C minus because because it's colorless and it can fit in a, a lot of different places. No, I don't. No, this wouldn't replace something like Arcbow. No. Is this just good as a colorless anthem? Not really. Three mana anthems are not very good. You know, see Radiant Destiny. Like it's that's that's not that's not that good of a card. A three mana anthem, just on its own, for only like. A creature type not for all your creatures because of like how how you have to like build your deck around it and as we were talking about like i don't think you're making your deck as strong if you're making just all the creatures of the same type kind of thing but yeah anyway we got manifold key uh pay one tap untap another target artifact or pay three and tap and target creature can't be blocked this turn um i think that the best thing that i've seen for manifold key that I want to be doing here in standard um, is play it with Mystic Forge, where this is you know look you where you can cast the top card of your library if it's an artifact card, so you can you know be you know it's basically uh, this is like experimental frenzy for artifacts and you know like this this is like a cheap artifact that you can put into play, and then you can also pay a life exile the top card of your library if you want to just clear off the top card of your library and then you can have this like untap your Mystic Forge. So you can do that again kind of thing. So that uh, that's something that, you know, could be kind of a combo-ish type card with the Mystic Forge. And besides that, like, just wanting a lot of cheap artifacts is kind of like what we want with... There's a lot of good cards in Standard that want cheap artifacts that are just, like, dying for any kind of playable cheap, like, one-mana artifacts between Psy and Sahili and your Tezzerets and your Karns and all that kind of stuff. They just want any kind of playable one mana artifacts. Does this get there? Maybe not if you're not playing Mystic Forge. Um, you know, you could be doing like your Steel Overseer kind of thing. Uh, also untap your Steel Overseer. So yeah, very, very fringe card here, but it could see a little bit of play. Oh man. All right, we're going to have to maybe speed this up a little bit. My throat is starting to really hurt from talking for the last nine hours now that we've been streaming. Okay. All right, we have Marauder's Axe, two-mana artifact uh, equipment. Equipment cre creature gets plus two, plus zero. This is just a limited card. We're not playing this in standard. Meteor Golem, of course, is in standard right now. A pretty decent sideboard card for the Karn decks. That's basically the only place where you're playing it, but maybe if we can get some more artifact stuff, like that that blue creature that taps and adds two mana for artifact creatures and everything, maybe you could see a little bit more of a roll, but it's it's basically just kind of like a fringe sideboard card. I'm going to go with a probably like a D then for like a fringe sideboard card kind of thing. Um and yeah, a card that you'll sometimes see play in standard. Maybe D plus. I, I do like Karn a lot, and this does work very well with Karn. We'll go with D plus. Um Yeah, I I see I see y'all saying that the, the stream just died, but I, I don't know. Like it should just be back any second. I don't know. Try to hit refresh or something. I mean obviously you probably can't hear me if the stream's kinda died. Um, but I'm, we're going, we're fighting through because we should still be recording for YouTube and everything.
All right, we got uh, Mystic Forge up next. Yeah, I, I don't know why the stream would just suddenly die. I have no idea. All right, Mystic Forge up next. Four mana artifact. Look at the top card of your library anytime you may cast the top card of your library if it's an artifact card or a colorless non-land card. Um, so pretty awesome card here because you know if we think about experimental frenzy this is a similar card here but it's just you know you're playing this in your artifact deck now experimental frenzy lets you play lands this only lets you cast cards so you don't get to actually play lands off the top but it doesn't keep you from playing the cards in your hand so every turn you still get your draw step you're still doing like your normal thing like your draw step but you just get to like play your colorless cards off the top of your library also uh, which is pretty sweet. And if if you have a card you don't want to draw next turn, you get to tap, pay a life, exile the top card of your library also if you don't want to draw like whatever cards on top. So pretty cool little card here. It's awkward that we're, you know, getting Grafdigger's Cage, which is like a good Grafdigger's Cage is like a good reason to be playing artifacts, and then this artifact just gets shut down by Grafdigger's Cage. So that's pretty awkward. Um there um so we got uh yeah so we got mystic forge um there and uh yeah so basically this is the kind of card that's you know it's kind of it's a build around card it's you know your janky build around kind of card um it could be better than that though like if there's better artifacts in standard the problem is there's just not a whole lot of great artifacts in standard but this could be a car card for a karn deck and this could be a card that does a lot more after rotation honestly like maybe uh maybe we get some more better artifacts in the next set and the the standard power level goes down a little bit um and uh and everything like that um so let's go with a so d d is like the janky build around card i want to go a little bit higher than that a powerful card that sees play in fringe decks is a c that's where i'm more at with like the mystic forge let's go with the c here for the mystic forge all right pattern matcher so can y'all can y'all hear me right now i'm not sure if y'all can hear me right now um, do I like Mystic Forge in Modern Affinity? I'm not sure, honestly. Four mana is a lot for that deck. Probably not. It would have to be a sideboard card in that deck, but sideboard, they have all the artifact hate, and it's a four mana artifact they're bringing into artifact hate. I don't know. Probably not. It doesn't let you just, like, cast the cards for zero. You still have to, like, spend the mana to cast your cards. So, no, probably not. Pattern Mattress, 4 mana, 3-3. Three, three. When it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a card with the same name as another creature you control. Reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle your library. So it's kind of like Squadron Hawk. Like, you have to have another creature out, then you play this, then you go look for another copy of whatever other creature you have. I think you'd rather just be playing, like, a different card or, like, another one of those other creatures. Like, I don't think we're playing this 4 mana, 3-3 three, three for that. We'd really have to want like some extra artifacts to play this card, basically. But I'm gonna go ahead and just give it the limited rating. And same thing with Prismite. Two mana, two one. Pay two to add one mana of any color. We're not putting this in any deck. I mean, you know, it's trying to say you can try to help get you to like the goalless cost or something like that, but. We're not putting this in a deck in standard. It's an L. Um, uh, re retributive, retributive, retributive wand. Three mana artifact. You can pay three and tap retributive wand to deal one damage to any target. And whenever it's put into a graveyard from the battlefield, that deals five damage to any target. Huh. So 
if you play this and you can sacrifice, if you have like a an artifact sack card immediately, it's it's you know three mana for deal five to something if you can sack it immediately. And that's that's just not a card we're going to be playing. That's going to be a limited rating there. All right, y'all are back. Cool. I don't I don't know what happened there. Like that doesn't happen when I'm streaming, so I don't know I don't know why that that happened right now. Like whenever I'm just regularly streaming arena, so I don't know what happened there. I don't know why that happened. Like, so sorry about that for y'all. Savager of Ruin, um, three mana, two, one. We have uh, Sacrifice, Savager of Ruin, choose target permanent card in your graveyard that was put there from the battlefield this turn. Return it to your hand. I think the main thing Salvager of Ruin is doing is, I mean, seen some stuff about like Teshar combos uh, getting some upgrades, and that's got to be this card. This has got to be like a Teshar card. It's a creature that costs three or less. It's, it's got to be a combo piece. I don't know exactly how it puts it together. I don't know exactly how um, that it, it works and everything like that. Um, but that's what this card is for. So if... Are we playing it in like a fair deck besides that? Probably not. Three mana, two, one. No. Nah. So if the Teshar combo deck does uh, turn into something, then this could be, you know, a role player in a highly played deck. Like that's its ceiling. So its ceiling is that it could be like, uh, uh, like a B kind of thing, a defining card in a single highly played deck. That could be its ceiling but it's it's more likely like a C or a D. I think I'll give it like a C, a powerful card for a fringe deck. I'll just kind of give it a safe rating if if the Teshar deck actually kind of pops up. It's really more probably of like a C. Um, and uh, yeah. If if you yeah if you can if you can sacrifice your wand and then you sack the ruin and get your wand back and then replay your wand I get like later on I don't think we're really doing that though I'll go with the we'll go with the C minus I'm not I'm not convinced by the te by a Teshar combo deck yet I'll I'll have to see it you know before I really know about that. All right, Scuttlemutt is a three mana, two, two artifact. Tap, add one mana of any color or tap target creature becomes the color or colors of your choice until end of turn. I don't think we're playing any Scuttlemutts here. So you, yeah, but so you need like Teshar and Tezzeret. And Sai or Sahili in play. It seems like you're going through a lot of hoops, and I'm not sure if I don't. I'm not sure that's going to be too competitive. That's why I'm giving it like. I'm not sure that's really a competitive combo deck, but maybe it is. You know, maybe maybe it will be. We'll have to see. Steel Overseer is pretty sweet. I mean, this is just this is a strong card. You you of course want a, a really artifact heavy deck, um, but this could be a two drop for a you know a Sai Sahili kind of deck like where you're making a, a whole bunch of servos or, or thopters um it's a pretty strong card that can just go in, in different different decks and everything um so maybe a powerful card for some play in some fringe decks like a C here for the Steel Overseer. Could be a little better. We'll go C+, because it can just go into like a lot of different decks, honestly. 
same kind of decks, but yeah, they'll, they'll be fringe, like fringe artifact decks, but it's a nice, nice little tool for it. Nice piece. So good piece of the puzzle there. All right. We got the stone golem, which is a limited card and vial of dragon fire. Both of these are going to be just limited only cards. We have a five mana four, four and the two mana pay two sack deals two damage to target creature. The Vial of Dragonfire, are we even playing this for our Karn deck, for like a sideboard of a Karn deck? Like this may be the sideboard of a Karn deck in best of one, where you don't have other, we don't really need to like actually have a real sideboard because you're playing it in best of one for like Mono Green Tron. Maybe there for Vial of Dragonfire. Um, but I'm going to give them both limited ratings there. All right, talking about the lands, um, the gain life lands are those are a good addition to standard. Like that's those are going to be better than like coming into play tap lands like normal ones that we have for people like on arena. They're playing budget mana bases. Uh, you get your lands that ETB gain a life. Like maybe you would want the black white land if you're playing like a really heavy uh, gain life deck. Also, like maybe you want that one. Kind of an uh, you know, like you're playing your Johnny's Pride Mate deck, you could play this kind of thing. But yeah, it's, I'm, I don't really know what to give them for ratings kind of thing. I don't know if they really need ratings, but that's where you're gonna find like the the ten ETB tap lands. Like they're they're basically like a budget mana base, a, a good addition, a better addition for budget mana base. Um, but yeah, like I don't expect these to see too much standard play, but. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe in Oct. You're still gonna. If we have like the Scrylands. Yeah, we'll have to see what the mana mana looks like in October. But yeah, let's talk about our other lands. So we got Cryptic Caves. It's a colorless land. You can pay one and sacrifice Cryptic Caves. Draw a card. Activate this ability only if you control five or more lands. It's not a bad land. Late, you know, late game. You get to sack this to draw a card. This could work with the the green creature, or or you know like the like there are, there are different ways that we've gone through. Uh, the green elf that's the one mana card, this Golos that costs more. There are different ways to like go search for any land and put it into play. And this could be a land that you put into play that you sacrifice to draw a card like later on in the game when you have more more lands that if you just like want to you know if you need another card you need a cycle kind of thing, go put this into play. Uh, yeah, sack draw card. Like Horizon Canopy is an awesome card, which is pay one tap sack draw card. And this is Horizon Canopy, and you know they put all these new Horizon cards. This is a Horizon land that's just colorless, and you can only activate it if you control five or more lands. So if you're a colorless heavy deck, if you can afford it, it's a pretty pretty good card. Um, yeah, I like I like this card, honestly. Maybe I'll give this a C. Let's give it a C. No, maybe a D. But it's it's not a bad card. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about those. Um, Evolving Wilds, we know we have that in standard. Uh, you know, this has already been standard. Like, this is just kind of a regular standard card. Yeah, we don't really need to rank these, rate these common lands. We know about this one. All right, Field of the Dead. When it enters the battlefield, it enters the battlefield tapped. You tap, add a colorless mana, and whenever Field of the Dead or another land enters the battlefield under your control, if you control seven or more lands with different names, then create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. This really feels like a scape shift card. Like, this is a scape shift combo, right? Like, you you play scape shift with, like, your se- you have seven lands, you play scape shift... And then you have to put you put in, then you just put seven lands into play that all have different names, and then you make seven two two zombies because they all enter and they all see each other, and you make seven two twos. So that's pretty poor combo. You have to have a whole lot of different lands with different names and everything. Yeah, that's that's a pretty pretty janky combo deck that I don't think is gonna really ever do anything or see play 
I'm going to just go with F with Field of, <laughs> uh, with Field of the Dead there. Because, see, it doesn't really work with Dread Presence. Because Dread Presence, you need to have a lot of swamps. This, you need, like, lands with different names. So you can't just be playing a whole bunch of swamps. So you can't really have, like, that Scape Shift be, deck be, like, the same things kind of thing. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty pretty tough there. All right, we have <clears throat> Lotus Field up next. Lotus Field is hexproof, enters the battlefield tapped, and whenever it enters the battlefield, you sacrifice two lands, and you can tap and add three mana of any one color. This land's really, really cool. If we're like being able to search for any land, you know, with some different things, like Golas, you can go find this, this land, put it into play. I just don't know really what we're like ramping into or what we're doing with this land. But I guess it doesn't actually ramp if you're just playing it for good. If you're sacking two lands, then you, you only gain one extra mana. So it doesn't actually ramp in that in that part. It's just like playing an extra land later on. It's basically, are you going to make combo decks, as we talked about before, with brought back in white to be able to bring your two lands back that you sacrifice? Or in blue, there's, turn. I think, turn aside. I think that's the name of it. That counters a triggered ability, so it would counter the ability here that to sacrifice two lands. <clears throat> so you would just get, be able to keep your lands. So are we are we uh, are we playing some kind of combo deck with those cards? Um, there's other lands that want, or other cards that want lands in the in the graveyard, like the Red Cavalier, for example. That wants lands in the graveyard. Are we, are we doing stuff with those? Yeah, Blood Sun. Blood Sun's a combo. Basically, is there some payoff there with those cards? With playing like those cards that are not very good, putting them in your deck, is there a good payoff for those? Um, the Hexproof is very, very relevant with this card. This card would be unplayable if it didn't have Hexproof. But the hexproof does make it playable. So I don't know. I don't know what we're gonna do in standard with those things. I don't know if this is just kind of good enough just to play as like a, a land as like a normal land that you just sac you you're fine sacrificing your two lands because it helps fix your mana so much. It works really, really well with these cavaliers that all have like these triple mana cost. This lotus field helps you out there. Um I don't know. I expect this to see a good amount of play, or at least people will be trying it out at first. Um, so maybe like kind of like a B, like a role player among multiple decks kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know if like, honestly, I don't know if I'm honestly supposed to give ratings to lands. I don't like these ratings don't really work with lands, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to give a letter grade to lands. Um... Yeah, Blood Sun doesn't make it lose it, it Blood Sun makes it lose the sacrifice two lands clause. We're we're gonna try Lotus Field. We're gonna try some some Lotus Fields and everything. Um yeah, Blood Sun makes it come into play untapped and no and doesn't sacrifice anything. Um Yeah. Is Alpine Moon still in standard? I think is it still in standard? Maybe it is. I don't remember. All right, let's talk about the temples a little bit. So yeah, basically, okay, so basically a lot of potential with this card. There's also a lot of down, like a, a pretty low floor. There's a there's a good chance that this just doesn't see very much play, but there is a lot of potential with some cool, cool combo interactions with, with the card. But even just playing it, like playing it straight up, is it good enough? And yeah, it just kind of, it's just kind of, it's three mana, but you sacrifice two other lands. It's basically, you know, it's basically just net one land with one mana, which is what lands do. So it's even kind of good enough just straight up. So it doesn't have a very low floor or sorry. Yeah. It doesn't have a very low floor. Like it's, it's going to be just a, just fine for a land. 
and the ceiling is pretty high here. So this is kind of like a, a card that not super high probability that it's like a card that's played everywhere, but there is there is a high, there is a there is a chance that Lotus Field is kind of played in in lots of different decks, and like in like two months, you're just always like, yeah, you just put four Lotus Fields in your deck, kind of thing. There is a chance that that's that's the case. There's a chance that's like, oh, you always put four Lotus Fields in your deck, and you always try to play these other crappy cards like Blood Suns and all those other things to try to get more you know, uh, brought backs and things like that to try to get more value from your Lotus Fields. There's a chance. Okay, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe four Lotus Fields, bad, but, but maybe you just put one Lotus Field in every deck. Like honestly, that's that's a lot higher chance than the four, of course, but. There's a chance that just like every single deck, you're like, all right, we'll play a Lotus Field because like later on in the game, you just you just want it. I don't know. There's a chance for that. Okay, uh, temples. So right now, like these temples are good. I've had a lot of people not not understand that like if like these temples are very good or not. You know, seeing like ETB tapped and like is this really better that you get to scry one instead of gain one life yes scry one is much much more valuable than gain one life um however with how our mana base is right now with with what we have for these three color decks with um let's see if we can get the other temple kind of in here there we go temple of triumph you're kind of chilling in here uh with how we have all these shock lands and buddy lands the mana bases work really, really well together, and you do want some basics in there too. So there's, there's honestly, there's not room for these temples in the three color decks right now. You know, like your Esper decks, your Grixis decks, you're probably not playing any temples. Like maybe one or two, maybe, but you're, you're really not probably playing your temples. Um, however, with the two color decks, I love these temples, and I, I am going to be playing. Like if we're making Orzov deck, we're putting four Temple of Silence in there to go with our other uh, four dual lands, like you want 12 dual lands it's that that do, is going to make your mana better and it's it's going to be good there same thing with your your golgari decks and, and so on like your simic decks you're playing four temple of mysteries also especially like your your simic ramp decks that are getting like your extra mana the scry one is really nice and uh yeah so i i really think that you want four of these lands in those decks i i think that the enters the battlefield tapped is not as big of a downside for getting to scry one think about like whenever you mulligan think about like if you don't if you don't under, if you haven't played the scry lands before and you don't really quite understand how powerful the scry one is think about whenever you mulligan to six and you have a sketchy hand on six and you're like well i'll keep because i get the scry one that will help me smooth it out that's like what you get for different type different times like just throughout like the game that you get to just play your temple like early on do you have like you know f did you keep a five lander well, your temples will really help you make sure you don't draw extra lands and make sure you draw spells kind of thing. Did you keep like a two lander, but you got like a couple temples? Well, you play them, then, you know, if it's a spell, you get a ditch and you get to make sure you you hit your land drops kind of thing. Later on in the game, you know how like drawing lands late in the game is awful. Drawing temples late in the game is really not that bad because you get to play your temple, take a look at your next card, make sure it's not a land, you know, get that scry one um it's it's kind of like drawing it's kind of like drawing a card there in the late game because uh, of how you get to like set your next because like whenever you play your temple how it feels you you feel like okay well at least my next car, my next card that i draw it should be pretty good shouldn't be running into another land like that um so like these cards are are good now how like i've like i said i'll say it again for the three color decks how like the mana base is designed the temples don't really fit into them because the shocks are so important and the the buddy lands that go with the shocks are really important and it just doesn't quite fit you know after rotation we'll see what lands we get in the fall and we'll see how they kind of fit together uh but but these do work just fine with with shock lands of course uh like where shock lands can come into play untapped for you these come into play tapped though they work fine with shock lands but for the two color decks right now when you're like especially these three colors that are right here uh black green blue green and black white where they have like some 
some good reasons to just be playing like your two colors. Like you have enough good cards in, in like these two color pairs. You have some good, you can have like, in, you know, your Orzhov Aristocrats or just Orzhov Midrange, your Knights, all that kind of deck, your Black Green, your, your Assassin's Trophy, Field of Ruin, uh, heavy deck. Like Temple of Malady or Temple of Milady, depending on how you want to pronounce that, uh, does really make your Field of Ruin green-black deck a lot better because having 12 dual lands makes it easier to play four Field of Ruins by quite a bit there. Having the, all the Temple of Mysteries, while the Temple of Mysteries for your Simic Ramp deck don't like or don't go great with Nyssa because they don't add extra mana with Nyssa, they help you find like your Nyssas, your mass manipulations, your crises. Because you know you're with those kind of decks, you're just playing a whole bunch of mana creatures and lands, and you have a few cards that you really want to draw, and you you need to draw them really bad. And like that's what the temples do. Uh, that's what Temple of Mystery would do for that deck also. It also helps if you have like those extra cards, your big cards, Temple Mystery helps you hit your land drops because that deck needs to hit lots and lots of land drops also. Um, so yes, these are definitely much better than Gates. <laughs> um, they, are, they are powerful lands. Uh, the These three color combinations in the middle here are maybe three of the best colors that they could use like in standard right now. So it was, it was really good for them to be the enemy colors right now because these three color combinations could really use them uh rakdos could really use them also a, a lot more than temple of triumph like boros boros is just not a very good color com it's the worst color combination right now uh boros there's just not even good like boros planeswalkers and things like that like so this this temple won't really see play uh this one you know you have like your is it drakes and stuff is it drakes is a little bit different how it it's playing a whole lot of velocity, which I mean by that by like card draw. So and it and that velocity is is cheap. You know your charter courses, your discoveries, your ops, your all that kind of stuff. So the enter the battlefield tapped is is a little worse in that deck because you have so much of like those those cards that you really want to be spinning your wheels with early and all the time. And plus, when you're playing all that kind of card selection. And, you know, velocity through the deck, when you're really churning through your deck like that, the scry one is 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 not as valuable when you're playing all that card draw also. So this one's not as valuable as these others. But these others, these three in the, the two color decks, these are all four ofs in those in the two color decks, for sure. Kind of thing. Um Yeah, I guess I guess Boros Feather is a deck. All right, Boros Feather is a deck. They got but God's willing. That's a deck. This is a four of for sure in, in Boros Feather. Okay, that is a deck. All right, All right. good good call. That is a deck. So, yeah, this would be a four of in your Boros Feather deck. Help you make you know help you find Feather. Help you find your God's willing, and so on. And God God's willing, you will triumph after that. All right, so that's that's uh, my talk about the temples. Then the rest, we just got some basics after this. That's all right. Yep. Okay. So for those of you that haven't really played temples before, I've, I've seen a lot of people underrating the temples from like the from people in in chat and everything. And so that's that's like uh, what I want to say about temples. They're very good, but three color the three color mana bases that we have right now, no, they don't really fit in them. All right, so that is our last. That's going to finish up and conclude our Core Set 2020 set review. Um, so, yeah, thanks everybody for watching here. Uh, it took us nine and a half hours of recording time, but of course, uh, it wasn't that much uh, on the YouTube channel. It was a little less, but hope you went through all of it. Hope you liked it. I didn't put uh, the lands really, didn't really give the letter grades for the lands. I uh, don't think they really need them. Uh, as far as the colors and the multicolor cards go, I guess to, to finish this one out, the Graft Diggers Cage, we gave that one a B plus. Your your Rock, we had a, a B minus. And those were the only two cards that were B or higher for the multicolor and colorless. Maybe maybe I started giving a little bit harder, harsher grades here towards the end. Um, but yeah, if you missed any of the other ones, make sure you're at the YouTube channel, checking them all out uh, and everything, getting ready for course at 2020 and standard. Um, the set releases on Arena on Tuesday 
and I will be doing a 12 hour stream on Tuesday, uh, probably noon to midnight. I think that that's probably the plan there. Uh, yeah, noon to midnight on Tuesday. I may bump it up an hour and I may do 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Honestly, uh, we'll kind of see. Midnight gets a little late for me. Um, th that's Eastern time. But yeah, watching this on YouTube. Hope you enjoyed them. Please hit the like button on all these videos. Uh, I'd appreciate that. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Um, but there we go. That's, that's our standard set review. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you're watching this later on YouTube, and I will see you for another video.